a little paper. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, what I'm going to do here, first of all, is everybody got their little papers there? Got them. So what I want you to do is maybe we'll get this side to read what you have on yours first. Okay, each person there. And while you're getting set up to do that, we'll start from the front and go get back. And uh, when you're ready to start, side over here, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkness. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. For the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but it is also overflowing in many thanksgiving to God. We, al <coughs> Excuse me. we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness uh, must not even be named among you, mm. as is proper among saints. Mm. Let there be no filthiness, no filthiness, no foolish talk, no crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. Instead, let there be thanksgiving. Good verse. Thanks. Uh, Next. Psalm 35, verse 18. I will thank you in the great congregation. In the mighty throng, I will praise you. Ephesians 5, 4. Let there be no filthiness, no foolish talk, no food joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where are we going? But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us to triumphal procession, and through us spread the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. First Timothy 4, 4, for everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving. Mm. Mm. One. Colossians 2, 6 and 7. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught about being in Christ Jesus. Okay. Okay, we'll start up here. This is uh, Zephaniah 3, 17. The Lord your God is in your midst, the mighty one who will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. Psalm 119, 62. At midnight, I rise to praise you because of your righteous words. Amen. Ezra 3.11. And they sang responsibly, praising and giving thanks to the Lord. For he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Mm. Okay. Uh, Psalm 118, 21. I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. Mm. Psalm 118, 29. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 105, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. And number 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Isaiah 12, 4, and you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call on his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, proclaim that his name is exalted. Psalm 75 and 1, we give thanks to you, O God, we give thanks for your name is near, we recount your wondrous deeds. 
Psalm 95, 2 to 3. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Amen. Okay. Let's stand and give thanks. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the record of those who loved you. And uh, Father, I wanted to give praise and honor and glory to you. And what a wonderful thing to think, Lord, that you are worthy of all praise and honor and glory. And Lord, we thank you for all of the goodness that you've shown to us in bringing us to know you bringing us to be able to give you thanks. And Lord, if there's anyone that's struggling to wonder if they can approach you, Lord, may they approach you without barriers or fear that they might worship you by receiving your forgiveness and grace. And so, Heavenly Father, we just pray for this time we have together. We thank you that uh, we can sing these songs of praises and read these words of praise as have done the saints throughout from the beginning. And Lord, we just pray you bless this time we have together tonight, today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Uh, I'm just going to, uh, okay, two here. I'm just going to start by looking at some verses from, I'm going to start with one, but I'm going to get a, a quick question. Uh, who was the first person to praise God? Now just think about it for a second. Just think that this week you say, well, what's in the Bible? Well, there's 4,000 years of thanksgiving. <laughs> That's one thing. But who's the first person to give thanks in the Bible? Hmm? It wasn't me. Abel. It wasn't me. Oh. Was it the uh, Buddha? <laughs> no. Oh. I could be. <clears throat> I have a friend of mine who's uh, who's into uh, uh, Buddhism and, uh, and and Jesus. He thinks he, he believes that they're the same, as you meant. Someone mentioned it, and uh, and uh, there's lots of stuff that's put out about the con the contrast. But one of them is that Jesus always was. And Buddha were born. That's a baby, because everything comes from that. Who is the creator of even that person? Anyway, who is the first person in the Bible to give praise or in an acknowledging God? Who? Abel. Okay, Abel. Now, where did he get it? Eh? Who did Abel get the idea that he should praise the Lord? Eh? Adam. Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a record of, though, Eve being the first one. Because she gave birth to Cain, and she said this. Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived, and bore Cain, and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. I have acquired. Now, you think about that. God had told her when the fall took place, God had promised her that through her, God would rescue the world. Speaking about Jesus. And here is this child born, she's thinking, oh, uh, yeah. This is what this is. This is the child that God gave me. Was it? No, it wasn't. Because then she gave birth to Abel, and you know the story. Cain was killed, or Cain killed his brother. Now, if you were Eve, if you were Eve, how would you be? How would you think? What would you think? Well, look at it. Chapter. Four, and I'm just going to read this. And it's a, it's a very, very wonderful verse about the beginning of worship. 
Verse 25, and Adam knew his wife again. Now you've got to remember, Cain now has been exiled. He's gone, so she's lost her son by being murdered by his brother, and now Cain has been exiled, and he's not there anymore. So now she's going to have another child. Watch what he says. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son named him Seth. For God has appointed me uh, appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also was born a son named Enosh, and men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, do you don't think that this is kind of a, some kind of wonderful, incredible woman? That she, she had faith to worship God, and she named her second son Seth, which means appointed for me. It's like God's appointed child, and you say, now, he had a son. And you can follow the genealogy. I want you to just get this as just I hope and we're going to talk about other Thanksgiving, but if you follow the genealogy in Genesis from Enosh over to the flood, how many men were in the flood? Anybody? Four. How many men? Four. Four. There was Noah, and who else? Sons. And his three sons, <coughs> and one of them was named Seth. Uh, Shem. Yeah. Shem. Shem. Uh, Shem. One of them was named Shem. He was one of the one of the three sons. Now, who's who was his descendant of Shem? It's a, and, a, and his story of Jem, Shem's descendant, now there are three boys, the first two didn't do too well after the flood. But Shem did. He kept the thing about faith in God going. And he had children. And I'd like you to turn to uh, a book. And uh, if you have your Bibles, just for a minute. And Job's gospel, Job, the book of Job. How many of you read Job? Okay, it's a hard book to read, eh? Yeah. But it's really incredible book because it's probably one of the most fantastic books in the Old Testament. Because who was Job? Doesn't say, eh? But if you follow the genealogy of him back, start with Shem and go up. Job's great great grandfather was Shem. That is the line through whom Jesus is going to come. So now, what is it about Jesus? What is it about Job that is so incredible? It's this. You know the story, but I'll just read it quickly. There was a man of the land of us whose name was Job. He was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil, had seven sons and three daughters who were born to him. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 donkeys, and a very large household. So that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. And you know the story. Satan came and says, God, if you take all that from him, he'll curse you to your face. Did Job do that? He lived through 30 something chapters of these guys saying, well, it's because you're a crook, because you're bad, because you're this, because you're that. And, and at the end of all that, it comes to chapter, uh, Job 38. I want you to just get this very important. So now we're getting ch at, at, at uh, Job 38. And so, here Job's lost everything. All of his friends and this other guy who lived fast, he's been talking, he, they've been talking to him, well, you, you should have done that, you sinned, da, 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 you did all this thing, but Job didn't do anything. He was a righteous man, right? And he was a righteous man that was suffering. Terrible. 
in his personal life, his whole body, he got, he got sick, and, and, and like it was just desperate. But then, all of a sudden, something happens. God shows up. Well, it's actually, if you're, if you're into the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, our communication of these kinds would usually be about Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus. He's, all, he's always present. He's the creator. He's the one whom, through whom God created everything. But anyway, here's the thing. So Job's there, and all of a sudden something happens. What does it say? Verse 38, chapter 38. And then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man, and I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched out the line on it, and to what were his foundations fastened? Who is it that laid the cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Where were you, Job? You see, the thing is about this, is it's like about when you think about Thanksgiving, when you say, when we read these verses, there's, there's verses that say, be thankful in all, what, all, what? All, well, We'd be great if you said, be thankful in 50% of circumstances. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? At least you know it's 50-50. Be thankful in all. Read why? Because God is always, always, always working through the life of believers, no matter what the situation is. No matter what it is. I was in, uh, went, had to go for a checkup, a heart thing, you know, went a while ago, got five years ago, four years ago, I guess it was. So I had to go to the doctor, and there's nothing weirder than being in the heart place. Because all it is, is people being wheeled in and out of operations. And, and so, like, it, it's like, uh, most, it's just the heart place, you know? That's all that's being done there. <laughs> and you're thinking, like, Hmm, I wonder how this is going to turn out. Right? right? <coughs> and, uh, of course, these heart doctors are so busy, they don't know what he says. He's zipping through his mouth and saying the papers and going like this. Hmm, it looks like somebody forgot to tell you that two years ago you were supposed to stop taking that medication. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what? I got a chance to be with this doctor, and I said, ah, don't worry about it. I said, I got a chance to live and see my great-grandson, my grandson, and, and so thanks for the life you gave me for those four years, no matter what you're going to tell me now. <laughs> and so we're working through that one. But it's, you know, God is present in good and seemingly bad because in all things, God is working to make you miserable. <laughs> what is, in all circumstances, God is working for the good. good. Sometimes we need we need to have nothing. Have the nothing. Have like the nowhere. Like Job is in a corner here. When you finish, there's. <laughs> There's, you finish the, 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 those guys talking, there's not, there's nowhere to go. Job is just there. All that to say is that God loves us and blesses us and we are thankful for him. But are we thankful for all of them? Not when we're in it. Not when we're in it. Stuff happens. Uh, so I'd like you to just look at a couple other verses. I'd like you to turn to, uh, if you like, uh, in uh, Acts chapter 17, uh, Luke, sorry. Acts chapter, uh, why did I say Acts? Uh, Luke chapter 17. 
Luke chapter 17. Let's see if I can find it here. And, um, okay. Um, it's a simple one here. Now, uh, Acts chapter, uh, Luke chapter 17, and it's verse 11. Now it happened as, and this is Jesus, as it happened as he went through to Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. Now I'll just stop there for a second, just to say that if you ever go to Israel, I hope you get a chance to go, haven't gone, go. Not now, though. <laughs> <laughs> but Samaria is right in between like Nazareth and up there in the north, where, where, the, where the, uh, the religious people would never go because they're just outcasts. And then there was Samaria, Samaritans were 700 years before Jesus, uh, the, the Jewish uh, uh, king of the northern tribes of Israel, the ten northern tribes of Israel. Um, they, they separated, remember, after the death of Solomon, uh, they, the, the, the kingdom split up. So ten of the tribes were in the north. And they were always, they had bad kings, ten bad kings, and they went downhill, down, 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 down. They were sacrificing their children to idols. That's how bad it got. So God finally said, like, okay, enough. And what he did was he went in and he took all the population of the northern kingdom out and populated it with people from that they'd taken captives from other places to keep care of the land and stuff, and they never, never, never went back. They just seemingly disappeared from history, the, all those Jewish people. Uh, okay, but some of them were left behind to farm, but they weren't allowed to practice any religion or anything like that. There is it, and they put, and, and so these Jewish people that were left as slaves, basically, and the other slaves they brought in to manage the crops, probably the Assyrians, they managed it all this stuff, and they intermarried. So the Jewish people would not have anything to do with them, even if they had some Jewish heritage or something, they would have nothing to do with them at all, in, right up till Jesus' time. Now Jesus is here, he's gonna go through Samaria. It's a shortcut. If you look on a map of this area, you have to go through Samaria as a shortcut, but most Jews would go around because they didn't want to get contaminated. So. And here they were, and Jesus is, uh, it must have totally freaked out his, his disciples, right? Jesus is always doing weird stuff. By the way, get that straight. Great. Jesus is always doing weird stuff, and he's got some weird animals. Read Ezekiel. There's these, there's these, animals, there's these creations that, that are in heaven that you say, like, wow, those things are, the description of those things are really ugly. Maybe they're beautiful to God. Maybe we're ugly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just read that passage in Ezekiel. You'll love it. But they're really, really, really strange people. So here, God, Jesus is always doing things that are out of the ordinary. Keep yeah. that in mind. Yeah. If you're trusting God, He's going to do something that's I would have never thought of that. Right? <laughs> never. Why? <laughs> because He wants us to trust Him, right? Mm -hmm. So what happens? Look. Now, so he happened as he went to Jerusalem, so he's going on this trip from north down to south, and going right through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And then he entered a village where they met ten men who were lepers, who stood afar off. And you know the story, I'm going to read it. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master. That's a good way to start a conversation with Jesus. Jesus, Master. Now these guys are lepers. Nobody goes close to these lepers. Nobody touches them. Nobody is like, oh, we're not only in Samaria, but we're in Samaria with lepers. <laughs> Doesn't God do strange things? Jesus does strange things. Expect strange things to happen. When something strange happens and you don't know what it is, go, well, God knows. Look what happens. Jesus, Master, have mercy on 
us. And so he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And so they, as they went, as they went, not when they got to the priests, because if you were cleansed of leprosy in the Jewish, Jesus is operating under the Jewish culture at that time. He said, if you were operating, if you were cleansed from leprosy, which was rarely happened, you had to go to that priest and be cleansed. There's a whole ceremony of it in the Old Testament. And so they went to the priest, so it was that they, as they went, as they went, and here's the thing, always the thing when God is doing something strange, you always got to go with what he's doing. Yeah. <laughs> and it's sometimes strange, okay? As they went, they were cleansed. And then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, returned and with a loud voice, what did he do? Glorify God, a Samaritan. Glorify God. Notice what Jesus said. And fell down at his face, on his face, at his feet, at his feet, giving him thanks. Did we ever use that word today? Yes. <laughs> giving, fell down on his face and thank God. <laughs> thank you, Lord. And Jesus said, Jesus answered and said, Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Where there are not any, were there not any found who would return to give glory to God except this foreign man? Uh, you know, I was showing that film there before because one of the, that, that when you came in, maybe you watched it a bit. It's like Jesus said, said 24. It's like a gathering of young people, they're all, there's no, <laughs> no there's no gray heads. <laughs> all young people, thousands and thousands, giving thanks and praise to God. Amen. Just worshiping God. Well, guys like me, going to the heart doctor, I'm on my way out. But these guys are, Coming in. I'm not out today. <laughs> <laughs> so look what he says. And so Jesus answered, Were there not ten cleansed, were there nine, and were not any found who could return and give and give glory to God except this foreigner? So the thing is, God does strange things, but he does strange things so that we will worship him. You know, in the Old Testament, God had to make it a law that they would worship it. You ever read the Old Testament? God had to make it a law. <laughs> you know, like, otherwise, they wouldn't have done it. As it turns out, they, they, both, the, you know, the, both tribes of Israel, both of the northern tribes went into captivity and never were seen again. Well, it doesn't mean they're gone. God knows where they are. And, 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 you know, Israel, the, the southern kingdom, they did fine, did fine, and then finally they, they slipped into idolatry themselves and they were taken captive to captivity mm -hmm. into Babylon, and you know the story of all of that. And they were not allowed to return to that until uh, God led whoever wanted to return from, back, from captivity to Israel. Only 50,000 went back. That wasn't very much. All the rest stayed where they were taken captive because they were all business, intermarried, and everything like that. And so they had a very small group of Christians, very small group of Jewish people in, in the end. But so they had all those empires. You had the, the Babylonians, and then you had the, the, the what's modern day Iran, and then you had uh, the Greeks. Uh, empire, and then you had the Romans. But they were always from that point under under someone else's government. And until 1949, when they made that Malfour Declaration, and there's a big story about that, is um, that guy there, the richest guy in the world, a Jewish guy, a family, they 
practically, the one, some of the richest people in the world, forget what their names are, went off the top of my head, but it'll come to me. Uh, what's her name? Rothschild? Yeah, Rothschilds. Rothschilds. The, the Rothschild family, so they, they said to the, to the British government, they said, okay, if you uh, let the Jewish people return to Israel, he said, we will give you money to rebuild the, the uh, because they'd just been through a war, the war, and they had tons of debt. He said, we'll clear off all that debt, you let the Jews go. Well, some went. People were already living there. The Palestinians were already living there. But they kicked them out, British government, and they said, OK, go ahead, you can live there. That's the story. And that's where it is today. Now, did God bring, it said, now, did God bring the nation of Israel back? Maybe. Or was it a political move? Maybe. I don't know. But here's the thing. I'd like to look at one verse. You know, there's only one thing really missing from, uh, from Israel in this war that's going on right now. And I'd just like to look at uh, one verse in uh, uh, Joshua. If you got your Bibles, you're looking at it just for a minute. Because it's, very, it's where we're living right now, isn't it? Uh, there's stuff going on. And uh, Joshua chapter, um, here it is. OK, Joshua chapter 5. You got your Bible? You're running out of time on your own. Joshua chapter 5. And I want to just read this. There's one thing that's missing. God is protecting Israel for his purpose but not like it is or was. Because in Israel, you've got the uh, Orthodox who want to rebuild the temple, which is, you know, which they are striving to do. And then they have this, the Zionists. They are, believe in the political government. It is not, they're not religious, and the two don't really get along that well. A house divided against itself cannot stand. So they can't, they can't get it together because they can't agree on how what the state should look like. But anyway, but they're missing one thing. They're missing one thing. And it's going to be a miraculous thing that happens when they realize that. But it's here. And, and this, uh, it's described and what, what they're missing. And uh, in Joshua chapter 5, it says this. <clears throat> now, you know the story that uh, they're getting ready to... Uh, enter the promised land. Um, they're they're going to take over Jericho. But something strange happens. Verse 13 of chapter 5. And it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked. And behold, a man stood opposite him. <laughs> the man is always standing opposite you when you think that you've got it all figured out. <laughs> it may be that you are going to do something or you think something that's not true. Well, there's going to be a man, and this is, the, but primarily here, this is the man of Israel. Look at it. You know the story. And it came to pass when Joshua was at Jer by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or are our poor adversaries? <laughs> Nothing's changed, has it? <laughs> for the Jewish nation. <laughs> are you for us or against us? And that's the same, they're still asking the same question. And he said this. So he said, No. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Who is the commander of the Lord? Joshua fell down on his feet, uh, fell down on his face to the earth, and what does it say? What does he do? He worships. You see, Worship of God is the victory. Worship of God in the dire, direst of circumstances is the victory. And he says this, 
Joshua fell on his feet on the earth and worshipped. Gave thanksgiving. It's not about turkeys. <laughs> it's about being thankful to God. And he said this. Here's what Joshua did. He fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your sandals off your feet, for this place where you stand is holy. Every time you're going through stuff, it's holy ground. Every time. God wants us to be there. He wants us to be knowing that Jesus is there. He's there. It's holy ground. It's not a mistake. God forgot us. He was asleep. Like the guys on the boat. No. Because he wants us to realize that Israel's not there. The nation is not there. Not there yet. Maybe they'll be there one day through all this chaos. Because Jesus will come. And I'll close with this. I said I'd close when I close and I'm going to close. But just this one verse, uh, and uh, in Jerusalem, this is Jesus. Now here is Joshua again, the other, jo the same Joshua, this, it, it, he's there in verse 37 to 23, you don't have to turn to it just for the sake of time. The last words of Jesus to Jesus, to Jew Jerusalem, 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 the one who kills the prophets, stones those who are sent to you. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. And see, your house has left you desolate. For you will not see me, you will see me no more until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's where Israel's got to go. And it's where we have to go as believers in Christ. Right now. We know we have to be there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful, so thankful this Thanksgiving weekend. So many may uh, recognize Thanksgiving without Christ, without God, without hope. But Lord, as we as believers in Christ, we bow our heads before you. We thank you. Jesus, the captain of the guard, the captain of the Lord's armies. We thank you, Father, Lord Jesus, that you are, you are always in control of your people and their, and their faith. And Father, you know the purposes that you have for your people Israel. But Lord, we thank you that we, who can be of every nation under heaven because of Christ, can acknowledge you and worship you in spirit and truth. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you brought us to yourself. And we ask your mercy on Israel that is fighting against all of its enemies. But, Lord, it's your captain, the Lord Jesus, that must fight for them. So, Lord, we pray for that country. But, Father, we pray for ourselves. May we acknowledge your sovereignty in our life over every circumstance. And then give thanks in all circumstances. Because, Lord, you... You, Lord, are the Lord of all. And so, Father, we thank you this morning that we can give thanks to you for all the readings that were read. We multiply and say, Lord, thank you. We thank you for Jesus, for the tremendous gift of eternal life through Jesus, your Son, who gave himself for us, who became sin for us, who became our sin, so that we in Christ might be the children of God. Lord, help us to live bringing glory to you so that others may come to praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you and have a great day.